The hasty generalization comes about when a conclusion is built upon a sample size that is too small or a sample size that in one way or another is unrepresentative. Uh, for instance, a woman might say, I've been asked out by two guys and they both stood me up. Men are so rude and irresponsible these days. Is her conclusion, men are so rude and irresponsible these ways, uh, supported by the evidence? Uh, not by a long shot, right? The, the sample size is way too small. How many men are there in the world right now? Four billion? Three to four billion? Well, she sampled two. It's much too small of a sample size. And so you cannot conclude on the basis of two bad experiences with guys that all men are rude and insensitive or, or rude and irresponsible. Too small of a sample size. Uh, the other possibility is that the sample is unrepresentative. So suppose we say, uh, we took a survey of 500 students at Roberts Wesleyan College and determined that 95% believe in God. Therefore, we can conclude that 95% of Americans believe in God. Um, well, many of us would like that to be the case. Uh, that is not a good argument. Why is it? Roberts Wesleyan College is a Christian college. And though you don't have to be a Christian to come to Roberts Wesleyan College, the vast uh, majority of students who come to Roberts are Christian. And being a Christian means you believe in God. And so the problem here is the sample size is poorly chosen. It's an unrepresentative sample of all American citizens as a whole. Right? So if you wanted to find out what percentage of Americans believe in God, you could, you, you could um, uh, survey people from many different populations, some in college, some who aren't, people who are uh, blue-collar workers, white-collar workers, different racial backgrounds, different parts of the country, and so forth. But to take your entire sample from one place, especially from a Christian college, uh, would be a, a hasty generalization. It's a generalization that's based on an unrepresentative sample size. Okay, so that's our hasty generalization. The conclusion is built on a sample size that's either too small or is unrepresentative. All right, the next uh, fallacy of weak induction that we need to discuss is the fallacy of the false cause. Now, the fallacy of the false cause starts with some event or phenomenon. Uh, and this is how you can tell it from some of the other fallacies. Some event or fact is, is uh, cited, and then, uh, then a, a purported cause is introduced. So a fact is cited, and the cause is suggested. Um, the problem here is that the cause that is suggested is not at all likely to be the cause. Sometimes it's because... Uh, it might be one contributing cause, but there might be many causes of the event. And so the person is taking too simplified of an approach. In other cases, the, the cause might not be, um, uh, the, the purported cause might have no connection whatsoever uh, to the fact or the phenomenon that's being discussed. For instance, someone might say, New York City has more churches than any other city in the country. It also has more crime than any other city in the country. So clearly, if we want to get rid of crime, we should abolish the churches. Right? Or someone might say, clearly, the cause of crime in New York City is too many churches. All right? So there, there happens to be a lot of churches, and there happens to be a lot of crimes. The problem here is that the arguer is assuming there's a connection between the two. The fact is, New York City, by far, is the largest city in the country. So that's why it has more churches than any other city in the country. Uh, and it's also why it has more crime. But there's no conceivable connection between churches and crime. It certainly hasn't been established by those two facts. And so this is a good example of a false cause um, fallacy where there's really no reason to suspect that the purported cause really had anything to do with the phenomenon. Another example of, of this sort of false cause fallacy might be this. Uh, I actually went to University of Notre Dame, so my, I got my PhD from Notre Dame uh, in uh, 1999. Well, ever since I attended Notre Dame, 
with the exception of last year, the team has been terrible. They've been terrible in bowl games. They, they hardly ever have gotten into the top ten, let alone the top five nationally. And so maybe I could make this argument. Ever since I went to Notre Dame, the teams have been terrible. Clearly, I jinxed them. All right, so I conclude from the fact that these two events happened at around the same time. I went to Notre Dame, and Notre Dame st uh, sports teams, especially football, I'm really thinking about football, uh, Notre Dame football teams have started doing poorly. Those two events happened around the same time, and I kind of assume that there's a connection. But clearly there's no connection between the two, it's just a coincidence. But instead of realizing it's a coincidence, I argue that I somehow jinxed the Notre Dame football team, which I didn't. Uh, and so that's a false cause analogy. Sometimes we're confused because two things happen at the same time, we, and we assume that there's some sort of causal connection. All right, so the false cause fallacy gives us some sort of event or some sort of phenomenon, and then uh, proposes a cause of that phenomenon or event, which is not at all likely to have been the cause, or at least not the sole cause of the event. Okay, now, the next fallacy of weak induction that I want to discuss is the slippery slope fallacy. Now, sometimes people will even use the term slippery slope in their argument. Say, oh, I don't agree with that. That's a slippery slope. Once you do A, that's going to lead to B. Once you do B, that's going to lead to C. And C is bad, right? Some people proudly embrace the name slippery slope, but the slippery slope style argument is almost always a fallacy. The conclusion of the argument is based on the assumption that an unlikely chain of events will lead to some unpalatable outcome. So, if we agree to this, if we agree to position A, or we allow A to happen, A will lead to B, B will lead to C, C will lead to D, and D is horrible. So, we should not endorse A. Right? So, there's sort of a, a slope. One thing will lead to another. There's a chain of events that will occur. Um, the problem is that uh, it is very unlikely that A will lead to C unless the connection between A and B and the connection between B and C is very probable. In, um, in, uh, uh, in determining probabilities, we multiply the likelihood of each event with the other. So if the probability of going from step A to step B is one half or 50%, and the probability of going from B to C is one half, or 50%. We multiply those together, and you get the probability of going from A to C as being 25%. Not at all likely. Uh, and so, uh, it's in order for a slippery slope style argument to be successful, the likelihood of each, uh, of, of each link in the chain has got to be very high maybe, depending on how many links, 70 or 80 percent or 90 percent. Uh, and almost always when people use these styles of arguments, the connection between the, these events is not nearly as, as probable as that. So, for instance, uh, here's a, a slippery slope argument. If we allow health care reform, this will lead to government getting involved in other aspects of our lives, such as banking. Government may decide that it can spend all of our money better than we can, and so it will take control of all of our bank accounts. Government will then probably decide that as long as it's controlling our bank accounts, it should probably control what kind of jobs we do. And so, if it controls what kind of jobs we do, it will probably say, you know what, we know best, we'll tell you exactly where you can live, and who you can marry, and exactly what you can do. In the end, we end up with a communist dictatorship in which every action, choice, and, and um, possession of every citizen is controlled by the government. So clearly, we cannot allow health care reform. Right? So the slippery slope argument uh, mentions a number of things that can happen. We get to the end, we get from health care reform to a completely totalitarian and communistic state. Um, now, if it was, if it was likely that each one of those things follows from the next. If it was extremely likely, maybe it would be a good argument. But there were a number of steps in that argument, and uh, none, no one of those steps was even probable.